Dear Harold James, dear Stefan Kohlef, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Cornelia Woll, and I'm the president of the Hertie School, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the Henrik Enderlein Forum uh, here today for this joint event with the Ludwig Erhard Forum Academy, where we're hosting a wonderful lecture from Harold James on globalization and the idea of the West. The topic of globalization is, of course, an important one. It is a force that is hovering uh, in the background in the discussions of the paradigm shift we have in particular in Germany about Zeitenwende, um, but more generally following the Russian invasion of Ukraine in uh, 2022, an event that many consider to have put a definite end to the post-98 uh, period of what is sometimes even called hyper globalization, although I will let that discussion to the experts. And this new era is one marked not only by a land war in Europe and an armed conflict in Gaza, but the potential to turn into a regional war in the Middle East, but also sees the return of great power competition and the securitization of the economy that has harked us back to earlier times. We realize that the economy, which was this conveyor belt of globalization, really is much more political than some may have led us uh, to believe. And there is the return now to just fall back into smaller, more regionalized, more secure, more uh, ecologically transitioning parts of the world and no longer um, work towards these global markets that were the main idea of globalization. That is, of course, the broad brush picture that you could probably read now in the newspapers. And uh, what I'm very much looking forward to is that the nuanced picture um, is much more complicated and requires a skilled economic historian. And we have one in Berlin this year, and we're very happy um, to have you here for this lecture. At the Hertie School, we're proud to be conducting research that helps to provide some of the answers on this ourselves in political economy, in international security, and also on the future of Europe and on uh, sustainability questions. However, another important part of our work is serving as a forum for experts to come and share their research findings. And for this reason, I couldn't be prouder to have Harold James be with us today. Um, because he is an economic historian that needs no introduction, but he'll get a very short one from me anyway. He specializes in German and European economic history as the Claude and Laura Kelly Professor in European Studies at Princeton University and as a professor of history and international affairs at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He's also the official historian of the International Monetary Fund, and I didn't know there was such a thing, but I'm very glad to see that that is in your hands. And he has published multiple very notable books on economic history that I do not have the time to list here, more recently also on globalization, but I'll just cite his recent 2023 book, Seven Crashes, the Economic Crisis that Shaped Globalization, which was shortlisted for the Lionel Gelber Prize and included in the Financial Times list of the best book of 2023 um, uh, books in the economics category. He's working currently on another book on this topic, uh, which is a productivity that I can only be jealous of, but I salute you for being so quick to work through these very important pieces of work that you can share with us. Before I hand over the floor, I'd just like to say a quick word of thanks. This event came together due to the excellent collaboration with our partners at the Ludwig Erhard Forum for Economy and Society. And I'm very thrilled that we now have this occasion. Stefan Kulev and I started talking about this, I want to say a year back, which is probably when you were not even existing uh, fully. So it must have been a little bit less, but I'm very happy that we are here today. A big thank you to Stefan Kulev and his team. And also a big thank you, as always, to my colleagues here at the Hathi School, in particular the communications team, for keeping all the threads together and making sure we have a very nice and smooth event today. So before hearing from our speaker, I will pass the microphone over to the academic director of the Ludwig Erhard Forum, Stefan Kohlev, to say a few words. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Cornelia, thank you for the super kind introduction and uh, 
as you just said. Thank you for this wonderful cooperation and thank you to your and my team. None of this is done by the invisible hand, as many economists believe. It's all normal people who are quite often invisible. So thank you and thank you um, for helping us to set it up. I won't be too extensive in what I have to say because you've come to listen to Harold, not to me. I'll say just a couple of things about the Ludwig Herrat Forum, a couple of things about this lecture series, then a couple of more things about Harold, and then we would be pass passing on to him what I call today our Tanz in and Mai with Harold James. Um, so the Ludwig Herrat Forum, as Cornelia just mentioned, is a young institution. FAZ wrote in January uh, this year that it's a still young institution, so let we are still young, that's fine. What we try to be in Berlin is basically two things. So we're the Berlin branch of the Ludwig Herr Foundation in Bonn. We try to be a voice, um, a new voice, and as we hope to say, an innovative voice for those somewhat old and somehow aged contents about the social market economy and order liberalism. On the other hand, we try to be a platform, and tonight uh, you're attending our one of our series as a platform where we try to bring people from all ideological and all um, um, from all fields uh, to debate about our times. Our times are troublesome. Our times are difficult, and uh, we firmly believe that it's a, the combination of ideas, the combination of various fields, the combination of various nations who can succeed in. Uh, solving the problems, but first of all, of course, we have to understand the problems. So that's what our Ludwig Herrat Forum is for. And thank you for coming despite the hot weather, and thank you for coming in spite the forthcoming holiday tomorrow. Above all, if you want to inform yourself about the Ludwig Herrat Forum, we launched our website just a few days ago, so you are free to check out ludwig-erhardt-forum.de, and then you see the plenty of events, publications, and uh, media appearances we had over the, that one year. <clears throat> okay. The lecture series you are attending is one of our series. The other one, which some of you have attended, is called Civilized Provocation. So that is not a civilized provocation today, even though knowing Harold slides, there will be some civilized provocations. But so this is our academic lecture series, and um, it's the third installment of it. The first installment took place pretty much last year at the time, in April 2023 in Princeton, where Christian Lindner gave a talk about the future of liberalism, and it was co-sponsored by the Ludwig Herrhardt Forum and the Bentheim Center for Finance at Princeton. Um, the second one, the second lecture was Markus Brunachmeier's lecture here in Berlin at the Humboldt University in November. It was about resilience and uh, resilience as a notion how we can handle our crises today. And finally, today we have Harold, who, as you know, will talk about globalization and the West. And the West, as you know, hasn't had a difficult, has had a somewhat difficult time over the past 30 years. So let's see where we are today. A couple of things about Harold, um, who I'm very proud to know uh, to be a member of our academic board, our curatorium. So Cornelia already said many important things about him. I'll just add that he's one of the important economic historians of our times. When you enter his office at Princeton, you should be very careful not to be uh, hit by some piece of uh, old books or some, uh, well, yeah, there are many things in a small office uh, which look uh, fantastic, but also somewhat dangerous if they fall on your head. Um, and I mean, economists today think by papers whereas Harold thinks and publishes uh, in books. And um, I want to share a tiny anecdote. When, uh, when we met, which was about one and a half years ago at Princeton, I had a pile of books uh, which I wanted to get signed. And he, um, sorry for sweating, I'm from Bulgaria and we sweat easily. Um, and the weather in Berlin was quite changeable the past days. So he looked at one of the books and said, I don't know this one, but I said, it's, it's your book, right? I mean, it's a co-edited volume which you co-edited. He said, I don't remember it. So I share the anecdote as an as inspiration to the younger scholars in the rooms, uh, in the room. And I wish all of you to get to a stage in your career where you start forgetting the books which you have written. Uh, and I'm very proud 
to have Harold as a friend, but also as, um, as an academic friend. And I'm very happy that he will speak tonight um, about a super important topic um, and his work. A final one, and then I'll stop sweating and pass on to him. Um, I'm very proud and happy that the fourth lecture in the Ludwig Herhaft Academy lecture series will be given by Cornelia in the second half of the year, and you will uh, get the insights and the details about that pretty soon. Without further ado, Harold James. So uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Pr President Vol. Uh, thank you, Professor Collif. Stefan's at the back there. Um, uh, very, very overkind introduction. Uh, I'm really touched. I'm deeply honored to be here and to follow uh, Minister Lindner and uh, my friend Marcus Brunemeyer and to precede uh, Professor Vol uh, in presenting uh, a lecture in this series of the Ludwig Erhard Forum. I don't know whether it's going to be a civilized provocation or an uncivilized provocation or any kind of provocation at all. Uh, but we live, I think, and it was already stressed by both uh, Professor Voll and Professor Collif, uh, we live in difficult, turbulent, and confusing times. Uh, so confusing. I think is the leitmotif that I would like to start with. How would you describe what we're going through at the moment? On the one hand, we're living through a period of technical change of a pace that is, I think, was at least unimaginable uh, to people uh, a few years ago. Um, we're living in a period when even the conventional laws about how progress in computing operates are broken. So we used to be familiar with Moore's law, uh, that the capacity of transistors uh, doubles every two years. Uh, and some people were already in the 1970s and 80s saying, well, it must be a time when Moore's law comes to an end. Uh, everything good comes to an end. Uh, everything bad comes to an end as well. Uh, but in fact, uh, the pace of computing is increasing today. And so the, the volume of compute is now doubling every six months. So uh, we're moving also uh, to a stage when it looks more and more realistic uh, that there will be an artificial general intelligence, and that will be a absolutely transformative uh, moment. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we don't know when, uh, but the time period is getting closer and closer. So uh, the people who lead in this industry, Jeff Hinton, uh, says between five and 20 years from now, uh, some Altman of OpenAI just says in five years from now. Uh, it, it actually re reminds me of something that I'll come to a bit later in the presentation. Uh, that is the debate uh, that there used to be on when China will overtake the United States as the world's largest economy. And uh, people in the early 2000s said it was sometime in the mid 2030s. And then the date got nearer and nearer and the financial crisis in 2008 moved it even nearer than that. Uh, and in 2015, uh, China became at least measured by purchasing power parity, a bigger economy than the United States. Um, so the, the, the speed with which China overtook the United States as the world's largest economy was staggering. But the speed in which artificial general intelligence is overtaking uh, the capacity of humans uh, is equally stunning. Uh, so we're in this age of just amazing technical change and uh, technical progress. And you can see the applications of it all over the place already. And uh, they will be even more stunning in coming years in medicine, in education, the way we work, uh, the jobs we do, but also the jobs we don't do anymore. But that story looks completely at odds 
with the second story uh, that people will tell about the world today, which is that the world is fragmenting and breaking up and uh, maybe even going back. And there are some experts in uh, geopolitics in the room. I see uh, Ulrich uh, there, or Schley. Um, the world is breaking up. Um, and are we going back to the world of the 1930s uh, when there were the great empires, the French Empire, the British Empire, the United States was extending a kind of informal empire over South America. There was the Nazi Empire in uh, Central Europe. Um, there was the Japanese greater Asian co-prosperity sphere and so on, and the Soviet uh, imperium. Uh, are we going back to that kind of splitting up? Actually, I, I don't think so. And um, the reason why is that there are indeed competing states, and I'll talk quite a bit about that uh, in the uh, next half hour or so. We're going back to uh, having competing states, but there are lots of other states and uh, they're in between and they're doing interesting things. So they're not simply in one camp or the other camp. Uh, so for instance, uh, Vietnam. Um, so I was in Vietnam uh, last uh, September uh, at the same time the president, coincidentally, at the same time the President Biden uh, was visiting and uh, Vietnam was just stepping up its relationship with the United States uh, because it wants to have a counterweight uh, to the power of China. Uh, if you look at some of the trade statistics, which are sometimes cited as an evidence of deglobalization or fragmentation, it actually becomes very difficult. The China-US trade is still increasing, but not increasing as fast as other bits of trade are. Uh, but what is happening is that the United States is importing more and more from Mexico and more and more from Vietnam. But then you look at the Mexican and Vietnam trade data and uh, you can break it down into specific firms. Um, and what's happening is that Mexican and Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese firms are buying goods from China and then processing them and developing them and selling them on to the United States. And so there are intermediaries. Um, and uh, that, 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 I think, is uh, part of the uh, complex world that we're living in. Uh, so a little bit of fragmentation, but also a great deal of balancing and looking uh, for new options. Um, thirdly, uh, you know, what do the markets make of this? Uh, the markets are euphoric. Um, th th there's a absolute buoyancy there. Um, they're celebrating a party uh, in the face of this kind of uh, uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty which includes the return of inflation. This is a um, poster on the wall of the central bank of the country next door to you, the, uh, of the National Bank of Poland, um, about the increase in inflation that the National Bank attributes to uh, the effects of the pandemic, but above all, Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, but obviously, inflation is actually also in many countries and is in some countries proving to be more resistant to anti-inflationary measures uh, than had been expected. So inflation in the United States in particular is increasingly obviously persistent. Um, and it may be that it's due to other factors um, and in particular uh, to the energy transition. If we want to do the energy transition, energy prices simply need to increase in order to depress demand and depress consumption. But that is going to translate itself into inflation. And so we might well expect this inflationary surge uh, to be longer term. So how does that all go together? Well, people think of the end times. So this was a photograph uh, of a, a horrible episode in London uh, just a few days ago, uh, where some of the cavalry horses uh, escaped. And uh, you can see uh, the white or gray horse, uh, Veda, 
and the black horse uh, Trojan um, escaping in panic and the blood obviously all over the front of the chest of the Veda. Um, end times and uh, in end times people have fantasies of the end. Um, uh, Ulrike Hammann uh, recently published a book on the end of capitalism. Uh, as a historian I found it fascinating because it reproduced the arguments and in detail as well uh, that were really already developed in the early 1930s uh, by the journalist Ferdinand Fried on das Ende des Kapitalismus. And uh, I wrote a book in the early 2000s uh, thinking about the end of globalization, but you know, I didn't really think it would uh, happen very immediately. I just was worried that some kind of repeat of the Great Depression that broke the world economy apart in the early 1930s and that Ferdinand and Fried celebrated this, this end of capitalism uh, was repeating itself yet again. Um, but now many people, as uh, Cornelia Vol said, talk about the end of globalization. Um, so I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, so, uh, th th this man, uh, Peter Navarro, who was um, the uh, trade advisor to President Trump um, and uh, was a long-term critic of China, that's why he owed his appointment to a series of books uh, warning against uh, China. Um, uh, and he argued that the pandemic was the ultimate evidence that globalization was not working. And he thought that the pandemic was a retribution, a punishment for the sins of globalization. Uh, well, Peter Navarro is now uh, being punished for his own sins. He's an inmate of the Miami Correctional Facility. Uh, he's one of the few people uh, condemned for their role in the putsch of uh, January the 6th, uh, um, but more serious people than Peter Navarro make the same kind of point. Uh, Larry Fink, in his letter to shareholders in the summer of 2022, um, made exactly this argument that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has put an end to the globalization we've experienced over the last three decades. It's left many communities and people feeling isolated, looking inward. It's exacerbated the polarization the extremist behavior uh, we're seeing against uh, across society uh, today. And it looks as if we're in a kind of uh, what the director of the CIA, um, William Burns, called a plastic moment, uh, deglobalization, supply shocks after COVID, the geopolitical insecurities, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the threats to Taiwan, the Hamas attack of uh, the 7th of October, uh, the disruption of trade in the Red Sea. Um, and so on. Um, so let's just see what the reality of this is. Um, by some measures, globalization was already slowing down in the aftermath of the global financial crisis in the uh, 2010s. And the period, the second half of the 2010s was the first period since the Second World War when world trade grew less quickly than world industrial output. Uh, only in a small part due to trade and tariff measures, though there were some, but also due in large extent to new technologies, which made it possible to do more distributed industrial production so that you didn't need to take your products from very remote places, but you could have automized production close at home so-called onshoring, uh, largely with robots, um, not producing many new jobs, uh, but producing some change in the direction of trade. Um, I thought it's also interesting and important uh, to think about this in terms of um, the longer term trajectory of world trade and world output. And that's what the work that I've been doing over the last uh, few years has been about um, thinking about turning points 
in the history of globalization. And I think you can see two in particular uh, that are striking. I hope the uh, figures are large enough to see at the back of the room. Um, good. Um, uh, two real surges of globalization, if you measure globalization this way as the ratio of global trade or global exports uh, to GDP, one in the middle of the 19th century, and then an even more dramatic one after the 1970s. Um, and also turning points where there's a partial reversion or a complete reversion uh, in the First World War, in the Great Depression, uh, and then this pausing effect after the global financial crisis uh, after 2008. Um, and um, we should also think about this period as one in which the focus of production changes and the most dramatic of those changes is the spread of industrial production throughout the world in the most recent phase of globalization. So the first phase of globalization in the late 19th century was really a story of the industrialization of just a relatively few number of countries in the North Atlantic fundamentally, a little bit then in Japan, um, and the rest of the world producing raw materials and agricultural goods. That's not the case in the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, where production has been more and more dispersed and complicated and long supply chains uh, are dictating the course of the production of the goods that we all consume. So um, the simplest way of showing this is to look at what happened in the most dramatic period of globalization since the end of the Cold War, um, since the apparent triumph of the West. Uh, if you like to go back to the one of the themes that I want to come to right at the end of the, uh, uh, the discussion, um, China versus the United States. Uh, so China uh, growing consistently quickly uh, and the relative share of uh, GDP continuing to rise and likely to continue to rise despite all the problems uh, that are obviously now today affecting the Chinese economy. Um, and I, I think that was uh, very, very obviously apparent in the global financial crisis. And I sometimes like to think of the uh, photograph that preserves a moment when the world is turning. Um, and fortunately, a moment like that was captured in one of the most dramatic moments of international coordination or cooperation of recent time. Uh, the London G20 summit in April 2009. And uh, there was an official photograph of the summit, which like every official photograph of the summit is rather boring. But then the unofficial photograph of the summit, uh, which was taken uh, by the same photographer, uh, showed, I think, uh, the new reality of the world. Um, and you can see uh, the Italian political clown um, embracing the president of the United States uh, and Barack Obama and the president of the Russian Federation, then also a comic interlude uh, or a tragic comic interlude between the presidencies of Vladimir Putin and the next presidencies of Vladimir Putin, uh, Dmitry Medvedev. Um, but you can see... Uh, at the bottom row, um, the Chinese president, Hu Jintao, looking completely unmoved by this clowning. Uh, the host of the summit, um, Gordon Brown, the British prime minister, looking slightly embarrassed by all this. Uh, but Hu Jintao looking straight ahead because Hu Jintao knew with certainty uh, that not only is his country doing the most to act against the economic crisis, but his country is likely to dominate the world economically in the foreseeable future. Uh, so Hu Jintao looking with confidence ahead, uh, while uh, Silvio Berlusconi 
uh, can look with amusement at the fading of the West. Um, let me insert at this point uh, something uh, from the book uh, that I, I, I think this uh, rather complicated slide uh, tries to present in one picture uh, the way in which the turning points of globalization happen. And the argument is actually very simple. Uh, that is that if there is a severe supply shock, in other words, a severe scarcity, then there's a whole shock to the political system and uh, there's geopolitical turbulence and social revolution, uh, but the world goes into a phase of more globalization afterwards. And uh, that was the case in the middle of the 19th century uh, when there was a severe food shortage in the 1840s. Um, the most famous part of that food shortage was the potato famine in Ireland, the failure of the potato harvest in, in Ireland, the potato blight. Um, uh, but it's not just Ireland, it's the whole of Northern Europe has cold summers with lots of rain and the crops rot and the people are in hunger and then in many places near starvation. Uh, in Ireland, starving. Epidemic diseases spread in the wake of that. Governments fail to deal with it. Uh, and there is more and more social unrest and then political unrest. And in 1848, a wave of revolutions sweeps away the governments over Central Europe that had been incapable of dealing with this challenge. And in the aftermath of 1848, the governments are very, very different to the pre-1848 uh, governments. Uh, Christopher Clark uh, has done a brilliant book uh, recently on 1848 and actually described it there provocatively as the world's first polycrisis. I don't know whether it's the world's first polycrisis, but you know, it's certainly one in which crisis came ev absolutely everywhere. And uh, the reaction to that was to say, we need to have railway systems and uh, we need to apply the steamships across the oceans so that they will bring food to Europe from very distant places. Um, so what happens in the aftermath of 1848 is that governments change their policies. They open up to trade as well. Uh, but above all, they allow the application of technologies that were already there because the steamship uh, was already there, the railway was already there, uh, but the steam engine was back in the 18th century. The big patent for the steam engine, Matthew uh, Bolton and James Watt, is from 1776. Uh, the steam engine is already there, but uh, it isn't used productively. It isn't used to create networks. It isn't used to create trade. Um, and what then happens is that you, you had little railroads, you know, in, in, in Britain, the first railroad was between Stockton and Darlington in the mining area of Yorkshire and in the United States in the Pennsylvania collieries, uh, in Germany uh, between Nuremberg and uh, the, what would become the birthplace of uh, both Ludwig Erhard and Henry Kissinger in Fürth. Um, uh, just a very, very small stretch. I, I mean, you know, Furt, quite honestly, is really, although you know, people hate it if you say that, it's a suburb of Nuremberg, uh, but it's, it's, it's five kilometers. And you know, you're not going to revolutionize the world by a railway line between Nuremberg and Furt. Uh, but if you span uh, the whole of the, uh, the, the, the territories, if you it, it pushes national integration in Germany and Italy. Um, it opens up the big plains of the Russian Empire, the, uh, the grain growing areas uh, of the rich black earth of the Chanazem soils. Um, you get food uh, and uh, food prices sink in consequence. Uh, Europe can feed itself. Um, uh, the world is integrated and poets like Walt Whitman celebrate the way in which the world is coming uh, together. Well, the 1970s are like that again. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, some people in the room uh, might remember the 1970s. Uh, the 1970s uh, were a period of great, great difficulty. And we were worried about some of the things that we're worried about today. We were worried about conflicts in the Middle East. 
Uh, we were worried about the price of energy. We were worried about inflation. Um, we were worried about the collapse of democracy. There were a series of books, the most famous ones were uh, produced uh, by a French writer, uh, Jean-Francois Revel, uh, How Democracies Die, Comment Meurt la Democratie. Uh, people were really worried about the collapse of everything. So this looked like Endzeiten as well, uh, the, the end of times. Um, but actually, you get a solution. Uh, and the solution is the increase in globalization. Uh, and in particular, the lowering of costs in shipping uh, because of the container ship. And the container ship is the equivalent revolution to the steamship or the railroad in the middle of the 19th century. Again, it's not completely new. There had been a container ship in the 1930s. From the 1950s, uh, regular container transport between uh, Florida and the port of New York. Uh, but you're not going to revolutionize the world if you just have one container line. You need container lines everywhere. And for that, you need ports everywhere. You need to overcome resistance. And my suggestion is, uh, when you think about the future of globalization, that you are actually seeing exactly this transition at the moment, that the technology that I talked about at the beginning is going to make it possible uh, to do many things in a very different way, in a cheaper way, uh, that will reduce the price of the scarce goods. And that includes uh, energy conservation um, methods. So, you know, when we look to thinking about how to overcome the environmental challenges, we're going to find it in the form of more uh, connectedness. Um, in the book, um, in each chapter, and you can see the last column, uh, I think about the consequences for um, economic uh, discipline, um, for, for the economic sciences, and each one changed the way in which people thought about economics. Uh, I'll only give you one example of that. Uh, the great interpreter of the crisis of the middle of the 19th century was Karl Marx, and he expected the crisis of 1847 to recur and produce the same kind of political upheaval. Uh, quite soon again, and he looked at the financial shock of 1857, and then 1866, and 1873, and none of them did this. In the British Museum library, he sat there copying out columns of figures from the pages of The Economist, and the, uh, or it had just been uh, started as a weekly journal in the 1840s in the London Times, he sat there copying out these columns of figures and trying to work out how they related. And he knew that there were good mathematical ways of trying to get correlations. And he expressed his admiration for the Belgian mathematician, uh, Adolf Ketterle. Uh, but in the same place, in the same British Museum reading room, uh, Stanley Jevons, uh, I think, without ever talking to Karl Marx, was actually doing this and was working out the theory of marginal pricing. Um, and you know, with that, uh, Jevons was explaining the revolution uh, that changed the world in the middle of the 19th century. Um, let me come to the present, though, a little bit more. Um, because uh, at the beginning, I started off with the idea that the stock markets were booming. They are, but not everywhere. And in particular, if you look at this figure, uh, you will see uh, that some stock markets have performed really very poorly. And in particular, uh, the Shanghai index doesn't look very healthy. Uh, this is from 2021. Um, the Hong Kong stock index is even more uh, painful. And the uh, Hong Kong stock index, the Hang Seng, is now roughly where it was in 1997 when control of Hong Kong uh, passed from the United Kingdom uh, to the People's Republic. Uh, whereas the stock markets in uh, the United States, in Japan, uh, and in Europe are soaring ahead. And uh, this, I think, is the beginning of something which I think is also quite interesting and quite novel, uh, that we're seeing a world in which the financial 
activities are not so coordinated, but we see divergence. Um, and we also have the sense that financial stability may not anymore be a public good that unites the whole of the world. And we might think that we're back in a world as it was in the late 1930s or as it was before 1914, when the governments like to use the threat of financial crisis to destabilize their opponents. And there's a lot of thinking now on both sides of the China-America divide of exactly that possibility that economic crisis could throw off the capacity of China or could throw off the capacity of the United States to mount an effective security presence. A historical example, I think, will give you a sense of how this could possibly operate. In the late 1930s, the government in this city, the Nazi government, um, mounted through intermediaries speculative attacks on the French stock exchange and on selling off French securities in order to push a crisis in France. Because they knew that if the price of uh, French government debt fell and the cost of borrowing in France increased, it would put immediate pressure on the budget of France. And in the circumstances of the 1930s, the only thing that you can really do with your budget if you want to save money is to cut back the military expenditure. So each time there was one of these financial panics in France, the French government uh, did a wave of cutting the military expenditure. And in that way, they prepared for the attack of 1940. If you listened to the extraordinary interview uh, that Tucker Carlson, the uh, American television personality, did with Russian President Vladimir Putin a few months ago, you will probably remember the half hour discussion about the origins of Russia's claim to rule the whole of Ukraine uh, because of the baptism of St. Vladimir or St. Vladimir uh, 1,000 years ago. But you may also have remembered uh, that there was a striking five-minute section of that interview where President Putin was talking about the 33 trillion American debt. The debt that Putin was waving as a kind of potential explosive that would blow up the American financial system and lay the way open for a complete reversal of the international politics uh, of the world. So um, thinking back to these panics, this is the scene in the city of London in the uh, first days of August 1914, uh, when financial panic was also the consequence after the outbreak of, of the war. And it was also an interesting question, which side could manage its financial panic most effectively? Um, let me go back to this question of divergence. Um, so I began with emphasizing the story of the artificial intelligence revolution. And uh, that was there, uh, but we've got to a situation where it's not just all the tech firms that are doing very well, some are not doing uh, uh, so, so well as others. Um, this is a figure that uh, Torsten Schlock, uh, used to be the Deutsche Bank economist now at Apollo, um, produced um, of the, uh, the last half year's development. And you can see uh, that really just two stocks, uh, if he'd gone internationally, he could have had the, um, uh, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC, as well. Uh, but some stocks, uh, NVIDIA and Meta, have really sh shot up. Uh, Tesla is uh, chugging along 
in the doldrums and uh, Amazon is uh, rather stagnant uh, in, in between. Uh, so it's just one or two companies that are really producing uh, this, uh, this revolution. And uh, it's, I think, also interesting and important uh, to think of where it's taking place. Um, and this also brings me to this theme of uh, you know, whether it really is the case that China is out-competing or outstripping uh, the Old West. Uh, this is private investment in artificial intelligence by geographic area in 2023. And I, th I think the figures are absolutely amazing. Um, uh, so $67 uh, billion in the United States, almost 10 times the amount invested in the next country in China, um, almost 20 times what's in the UK and everybody else, uh, Germany, Sweden, France, Canada, Israel, etc., are really struggling along there. Uh, this is heavily concentrated uh, in the United States. Uh, but the consequence of it won't be limited to the United States. Uh, when these innovations occur, they will be quickly taken up and applied throughout the world. Um, so let me think just for a moment of some of the consequences of this. Uh, so uh, I think this is the moment at which we should be introduced to Xiao Yiche. Uh, Xiao Yiche, some of you may know, uh, is not a real person. Uh, she is a uh, entirely fictional creation of a platform called Mino. Uh, this platform has uh, in China 650 million users and an amazing 500 million Chinese men claim, according to Mino, claim that their girlfriend is Xiao Yiche. Now, what happens in a world where your girlfriend is a chatbot? I think this is a worrying, worrying signal. So, you know, there are lots of things that are potentially very, very dangerous about this. Uh, I, I don't even want to start thinking about the military applications of, uh, of AI. We saw actually some of them uh, in the defense shield against uh, the Iranian missile attack uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but Xiaoichi is uh, really uh, the uh, future of the world. And uh, the question is that what do we do about this? Um, you know, how does Europe and the United States work together? So here, this uh, was a good relationship in the 1960s. Uh, you can see uh, icons of the city of Berlin, uh, John F. Kennedy, um, President Kennedy sitting there uh, with Ludwig Erhard. Um, uh, is this still the case? Well, Europe is curiously ambiguous about where it positions itself in this new world. So how does Europe think about the new world? There are, it seems to me, two different visions of Europe, um, and I've encapsulated them in brief uh, in these, these uh, uh, portrait uh, photographs, uh, uh, photographs of portraits of um, uh, David's famous fictional representation of the white horse rearing, you know, no blood over this white horse, um, and uh, the German philosopher uh, and author of Perpetual Peace, uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, so do we think of military conflict as a way of responding uh, to these problems, or do we think of a framework in which we can get uh, to Kant's permanent uh, peace. Well, l l luckily, uh, these two scenarios were reimagined for us over the last few weeks. 
so this is the picture of the uh, French president that uh, caused a great deal of, uh, uh, of um, consternation. Uh, this is uh, trying to show uh, uh, Mr. Putin that we're real about uh, increasing Europe's defense capacity and we're real about defense coordination. Uh, and then, um, on the other hand, um, actually just over a week ago, uh, here in Berlin, uh, the German Chancellor, uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, talking in celebration, uh, in commemoration, exactly on the 300th birthday of the great German philosopher. And those of you who heard that speech will have been struck by it. It was a rhetorically beautiful speech, a graceful speech, uh, full of acute intellectual perceptions and full of also resolute language about how Mr. Putin had misunderstood Kant uh, and that in the end, Kant would prevail over Mr. Putin. But the one thing I didn't hear in this speech was any reference to Taurus Marschkörper. Uh, there was no discussion of what the military response would be. And it looks as if, and you can see on the picture uh, that Schultz and Macron are looking in different directions. There's really still a considerable ambiguity about how Europe can mount an effective military response uh, to the challenges uh, that we have in uh, resisting Russian aggression. Um, so I think the same story is there if you think of the different views of how Europe can remake itself or how the United States can remake itself. Um, and in a way, it's a, it's a very simple difference um, that the United States has, and not thanks to uh, former President Trump, um, put an enormous amount of investment uh, into new technologies and is, is pushing. It's one of the reasons for the strong uh, inflation level. It's, it's, it's pushing a great deal of investment that in the end will make many goods concerned with the green transition cheaper. Uh, the uh, European response, on the other hand, is to uh, think about ways of making energy more expensive. And they, they look as if there are views of the world that don't match up at all uh, easily. Uh, how can they be responded to? I, I mean, I think there is a simple answer to it in the sense that the logical European reaction to what the American investment is doing is to say, this is absolutely wonderful because it's going to allow new technology to be cheaper and we're going to be able to apply it. So it's not just the American government. If I put the American government investment in AI, it's, it's trivial uh, compared to the private sector investment. It's about three uh, billion a year. But the private sector investment is pushing this change and everybody throughout the world will have the capacity to use it and to apply it. It's the same also with the green technologies that will be the result of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so we have a simple solution on how making America great again, um, in this sense, not in Donald Trump's sense, is going to be a way of re-galvanizing uh, the European uh, potential. But in order to do that, I think you need to overcome a number of problems. And those problems are the ones that I would like to close with because it is, I think, striking. Um, you may have seen these words that are sometimes repeated by people who are upset about the way in which the political process is moving. In the 1930s, in this dismal decade, as the threat of Hitler and the threat of Stalin was building up, Winston Churchill in opposition in Britain, in the British Parliament, on the back benches of the Conservative Party, talked about the government, the British government of the time. They go on in strange paradox. 
decided only to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift, solid for fluidity, all powerful to be impotent. We need, maybe it's too easy for an academic to say that, but we need more political courage. We need people to say that an American election fought between an 81-year-old and a 77-year-old, both exhibiting signs of mental decline, the younger one exhibiting much clearer signs of mental decline than the older one, but in both cases, uh, you need, I think, people to stand up and be courageous and to think of alternatives, even at this late stage. And of course, there are heroic people. I mean, I, I, you, if I wanted to single out some people, you know, I, I could think of um, Liz Cheney, uh, or most recently, uh, the Republican Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Pence, who really heroically swung the Ukraine vote against the Trumpians and allowed the military assistance that will allow Ukraine to uh, continue, we hope, to resist uh, the aggression. Uh, so uh, we, we, need, we, we need courage, um, but courage uh, comes in different forms. Uh, how do you do something really uh, courageous? And, um, you know, there I thought the German language offers resources of a kind that we can't even imitate in English. Um, uh, so I, I have these variants uh, that all come from the same German stem. Demut. Demut, humility is in some ways desirable. We should like humility. There's a striking passage in Theodor Fontana's novel, Cecile, where an old uh, court preacher, Hofprediger, says that demut is the appropriate attitude in face of the Almighty, but demut in the face of other human beings is not the right course to follow. We shouldn't go for demut too much. But hochmut is even more dangerous. Hochmut, arrogance, uh, is going to make you fail to assess your real chances of changing the world. And it's hochmut, for instance, to think in Europe that you can imitate the kind of technological advance that the United States is just doing. But you don't have to, you don't have to worry about that. If you really wanted to do that, that would be both Hochmut and a fallacy. Tolmut is much, much worse. It's not a very common word in, in uh, modern German, but it was quite common in the early modern period in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, Tolmut is the, uh, kind of act of a crazy man, um, a, a crazy man who wants to wreck things. Um, Ubermut uh, superiority uh, has the sides of Ubermut. You don't want to do that. You want to go for the simple, clean, precise term of moot. You want courage. You want the courage to do the military preparations. You want the courage to do the Marsh Kerper. Uh, you want the courage uh, to build up a nuclear uh, capacity throughout Europe. You want the courage to do what people didn't do in the early 1990s. By the way, this is one of the great lost opportunities, if, if, if I might say so. In the early 1990s, at exactly the same time in November 1991, when the Soviet Union was being dissolved, uh, and in the meeting in the woods in Belarus, in Belovej, um, Ukraine, the Russian Federation, and Belarus 
separated out of the old Soviet Union. In exactly the same time, in Maastricht, the heads of government were coming together and they knew that they had to do something dramatic uh, to respond to the geopolitical challenge. And this was one of the great opportunities that was lost because instead of saying, we need a military unification at that point, um, possible, but it would be enormously resisted uh, by the military economic establishment in the big countries, in Italy, in France, in the UK, in Germany. There are big military producers who all supply the national armies. Um, they don't want to lose that. They don't want to be integrated. And so instead of that, uh, there is something that I think is a dramatic and positive achievement, um, the monetary union. That was the grand European gesture of the early 1990s, but it's not enough. Uh, you need to go further. And uh, Emmanuel Macron's warning in this very bleak speech that he gave in uh, the Sorbonne uh, a, a week ago is, uh, is absolutely right. Uh, so if you want to know where these particular versions of moot are situated in the globe today, let me just suggest uh, that this is the problem, that you in Europe suffer from demut. We in the United States suffer from Hochmut, uh, China has Ubermut, and the Russians under President Putin are infected by a mad toll moot. Moot is what you need. Please go back to the simple purpose and restore the courage of politicians. Think of Winston Churchill and think of, you can think, I think, of heroic people in every European country, uh, but you have them in Germany. Um, we have them in the United States and we can make the world more courageous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harold, for what was a tour de horizon uh, over history, both economic history and history of ideas, but also many, many civilized provocations about our times. Now we have about 20 minutes and I would like to open it up for Q&A. So whoever would like to ask a question is more welcome to. As you could guess from the moot slide, Harold is fluent in German. So if you're more comfortable in asking your question in German, please feel free to do so. It would be nice if you say who you are so that we overcome some anonymity which would otherwise be uh, hidden in the questions. Who would like to break the ice? Thank you so much, a Bulgarian. Uh, icebreaker. He's showing some mood. Um, Eva Atanasov, of Bard College Berlin. Um, thank you very much for this incredibly rich lecture. There's a lot to take in on one go. Um, I wanted to ask maybe some, also resonating with Professor Wolf's um, uh, opening uh, remarks that there might be more political motivation behind globalization than we have hitherto um, used to recognize. So I wonder what you say about that. Is globalization fundamentally deep down a political project? Because part of what you said seemed to be saying, no, it's an economic law. You go after 1848, you go one step back, then two steps forward, and that's happened the same in after World War I and II. But one difference is, I guess, that what um, that this first chapter of globalization, the 19th century, right? It was presided over by the British Empire. That was the big power behind it. And it was taken over smoothly by the American <laughs> quasi-empire, a uh, child of the British. And now we're looking forward to potentially a Chinese uh, dominated world, which is a very different, yeah, it seems like a watershed potentially. So maybe that was a question. Yes, it, 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 it's, it's, it's an excellent question, and um, I, 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 I think it's uh, I, I, I absolutely right that um, we, we, you know, we had a version of globalization that was fundamentally along lines organized around British finance and British imperial rule as well. Uh, in the 19th century and a version of globalization where the United States is at the center of everything and the dollar is at the center of everything. Uh, and 
you, you know, what I think uh, part of the story of fragmentation is that uh, uh, you, that's why that picture of the London Economic Summit I find so poignant, actually, um, uh, that you know, China and particularly the people around Hu Jintao, who are now really out of, out of power and out of credibility, um, thought that what they were doing in 2009 was rescuing the world and that the reward for that would be that they would be included in the international institutions and the international institutions would be reworked. Instead, it was a kind of uh, long um, series of negotiations for quota changes that really only altered a tiny bit of the disproportion between the European uh, particularly the European and the United States uh, presence. By the way, this is what I'm saying is not, 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 not the official view of the International Monetary Fund. Um, and I have to put that disclaimer in. Um, uh, so instead, uh, what China did was to build up its alternative view of globalization. So the, uh, you know, when it comes to Xi, it's very, very different uh, to the world uh, that you had on that photograph. And uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is indeed a, a big vision of an alternative globalization. But what it does is run into the old problems and it runs into over indebtedness and uh, debt crises and negotiating those debt crises will be I mean, is already in Sri Lanka and Pakistan, uh, very, very painful and complex. Um, and uh, you know, there's no reason to think that that is any better uh, than the globalization of the past. It's, it's actually unlikely really to, to take root. And uh, I, I think uh, you know, the story of the Chinese government turning against the tech giants, um, the increasing debt crises, uh, the increasing belligerence um, of the, uh, the Chinese government in the South China Sea, uh, you know, all these are signs that uh, that, that particular project uh, has, uh, has run into the sand. Um, so, um, you know, what, what I think and, you know, why your question is so, so great uh, is what you say, it's, 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 it's political, but it's political also in the sense that you know, what's political about it is that in each of these countries, and particularly in these great moments of crisis in the 1840s and the 1870s, in the, I'm sorry, the 1840s, the 1970s, um, citizens in countries want effective government. And uh, they will protest and will demand changes. I think, uh, you know, an indication of that uh, was the way that the protests, particularly in Shanghai, just forced the Chinese government to do a 180 degree turn on the COVID uh, policy. Um, y y but you will see it in other places as well, uh, that when, when governments do counterproductive things, uh, they will face a lot of opposition and uh, they will have to rethink what they do. And so in that sense, this is political, of course, uh, but it's going to be driven through uh, by uh, citizens, whether they're in democracies or whether they're in states that we think of as autocratic, demanding better government. And uh, you know, the fact is that uh, in many, many countries, autocracies do things very, very badly. And uh, so uh, you know, if, you, if you wanted me to make a judgment in the end, of what's likely to happen over the next, you know, not over the next two or three years, but over the next 10 or 20 years, is a new wave of democratization uh, because of the way in which uh, autocracies fail. You know, they fail in COVID, uh, they fail spectacularly in Russia, uh, they fail in Iran. Uh, you know, these, these, are, these are things that uh, are going to be subject to increasing popular dissent. And, but you know, Western governments shouldn't be uh, self-satisfied about things. When they do things badly, they will also be punished very harshly by voters. McAdam from the University of Siegen. I have a question about the title and the subtitle of your book. It has such a strong emphasis on crisis. Uh, 
mm. um, in in it. And in your discussion, though, you also mentioned things like container shipping that are really more evidence, much more of a more gradual incremental change. The same might be said about telecommunications and so forth. And so I'm wondering, are you in part um, with the selection of your title too, are you um, in a way saying that sudden radical revolutionary change is more important for the shaping of globalization or is it just simply more interesting to write about? Uh, no, I, 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 I mean, I, it obviously is interesting to write about, but what fascinates me is exactly the moment that goes into these, these, these turning points. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you have a, a I mean, the technology, you know, the, the technology is relatively, you know, some of it is often familiar, but we, we don't think of the right uses of it. You know, if you would like another example of it, uh, the basic principle of the mRNA vaccine was developed in the 1990s, uh, but people don't see the usage of it. You know, they don't see how it can possibly be applied, except uh, it was originally developed, I believe, to deal with relatively rare tropical diseases, and there's not an enormous market for that. And then uh, COVID comes in 2020, and the vaccine is rolled out very, very quickly, um, and it's a dramatic success. And then the people who made the vaccine discover that it can also be used against common cancers. And you, 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 you have a real revolution, and uh, it, it, it's, it, it is a, a sudden crisis that pushes this adoption of technology. So the, the, the technology itself may have a long gestation process and a long evolution process, but the moment in which you break down the barriers to its application, and so you, know, you can think of what the barriers are to container ports. Uh, trade unions don't like it because the dock workers lose their jobs, or very few dock workers are required in a container port. Uh, it's not like the old business of unloading ships. Um, Doctors uh, are, are going to be affected by the kind of medical revolutions that, that uh, you can already see coming. Uh, so there are all kinds of vested interests, and it's in an emergency, in a crisis, uh, that you see what the possible uses are, and also that the forces that are obstructing the application of such technologies are standing in the way of solutions that would clearly quickly produce a benefit for a large number of people. And that goes back to the first question. You know, is this political? Yes, it is political. There will be a big political push at those moments uh, to apply the new technologies. And that's, that's I, 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 I believe, exactly what happened in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, it's what occurred in the middle of the 19th century as well. So uh, I, you know, I like telling the story because it is a dramatic story, but uh, it's also, I think, a true story. Uh, thank you. My name is Thomas Gaskin. I'm from the University of Cambridge, and I'm not an economist. I just want to give this disclaimer. But the story you've been telling, at least as far as I've understood it, is one in which waves of globalizations suffer from shocks, and the response to those shocks is, in a sense, more globalization. But if I think back to the sort of waves of globalization that we've had in the 19th and the 20th century, I also associate them to a certain degree with colonialism, exploitation, exploitation of resources in other parts of the world, um, exports of markets to other, other parts of the world, outsourcing these sorts of things. Um, and the other thing that I got from your talk is that you were very often connecting globalization to great power conflict, themes of imperialism, struggles between major powers. And I was wondering if you were able to maybe paint a picture of globalization that was a little more divorced from these great power struggles, or whether you could whether you could imagine a world in which globalization is a little less reliant on exploitation in some general form and great power struggle in, in some form. Yeah, I, I, I mean the nineteenth century globalization. It's uh, I mean it's, it, 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 it is about the expansion of empires, uh, but it's also about um, areas where there were no empires so or former empires uh, south america um, 
but I, th I think the, uh, you, you know, the point that you're making is, is a good one because particularly at these moments of shortages, um, you can see how there are particular choke points in the world economy. And I, th I think you, you, you can tell in some ways a local story of it. I mean, if you think, for instance, of the um, Eastern Mediterranean and uh, the Black Sea and the narrow straits and the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles uh, that link the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, you know, this is clearly a choke point. And if you are the Russian Empire in the middle of the 19th century, you'd really want to control that those straits and so the Russians pushed in and pushed to break up the Ottoman Empire in order to impose their control and the British and the French resist that and so you're struggling about the data no um, I mean in a sense uh, that's exactly the same kind of calculation that was made in 2022 I mean, there are lots of things that go into President Putin's calculation but one of the one of the calculations is also that if the grain trade, is interrupted if the ships don't go through the Bosphorus. There will be mass hunger in Egypt, obviously, uh, but also as far away as Indonesia. Indonesia is quite dependent on both Russian and Ukrainian grain. If it's not being transported through these sea routes, uh, you're, you're going to get hunger and unrest there. Um, and so, you know, looking at great power competition is exactly the key of these turning points of, uh, of, of globalization. You, you know, some people made a point that is very, very similar uh, to the one that you're just making in the middle of the 19th century. So in the middle of the 19th century, there were these great British uh, free traders. Um, uh, you probably know them well, uh, Richard Cobden, uh, John Bright. And you know, they said, Free trade is the answer to everything, um, and free trade will make the world peaceful. And uh, you know, very, very quickly, um, one of the, uh, you know, the great critics of uh, mid-19th century liberalism, uh, John Henry Newman, later Cardinal Newman, now Saint uh, Newman, um, said, uh, you know, the world of Cobden and Bright is unreal because he pointed at the Crimean War and he said, look, you know, this isn't a peaceful world. Uh, this is a world in which there's, there's conflict. But in the end, uh, there's something that comes out of it. Uh, Russia's defeated in the Crimean War. Things change in Russia. Russia integrates into the international economy and, 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 the, and the world gets more stable again. Uh, so, uh, you know, these, these moments, like the 1970s also, are very, very disruptive. Uh, but you know, I don't think that we should think that this is a permanent condition and that something will change. I mean, it can change, but I think it will change. Bon, also thank you for an inspiring talk. Mm -hmm. My question is twofold. The first is when world politics is entering a new stage, one is always in search of a new formula, an interpretation. Um, we are familiar with the end of history, the clash of civilizations. When you will look back in 20 years from here at our age, what could be the formula? And this brings me to your um, inspiring concluding uh, remarks on courage. Um, statecraft is about courage and character. And this brings us to the field of intentions. When Paul Henri Spark in 1961 stepped down as secretary general, Someone said in his farewell speech that um, he has worked so much uh, to fill the gap between what NATO is and what NATO should be. And that brings me to the question of intentions and the architecture of institutions. Um, and I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit on um, how you see the institutions Dealing with all the questions you mentioned in your speech, do we have to find a new architecture and what is your outlook? Thank you. Well, uh, I, 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 I mean, thanks, Ulrich. It's, it's, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, as you, as you imply, 
there isn't a simple answer to it. Um, uh, I mean, simply, a lot of the existing institutions don't work very well. Um, and people have been wondering and worrying about how to how to uh, reconstruct them. I think probably in the in the middle of something, you don't necessarily see how the solution is is uh, is, is, is 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 going to uh, l look like. But you know, let me take those two moments in the middle of the nineteenth century and in the nineteen seventies to give you something of a historical. Uh, uh, account of how it looked in the past as a guide to what it might look like at the moment. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, um, th 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 there was an absolute uh, wave of internationalization to deal with new problems. And so, um, you know, one of the things was that this period of geopolitical conflict to go past, to go to the previous uh, uh, question, was incredibly bloody and uh, violent and uh, you know, seem to uh, violate a lot of the norms of human decency and human interaction. And so in the early 1860s, a, um, a Genevan businessman, uh, Henri Dunant, who'd been on the battlefield of these very bloody wars of Italian unification of Magenta and Solferino, um, uh, you know, founded the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, a few years later, uh, Napoleon III wanted to have a conference to have a world monetary unification. He didn't quite get it, but what he did get was really to push the world uh, to going on to the gold standard. In the 1970s, um, uh, you know, again, you know, showing that uh, the, the French-German duo can do something. Um, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, as finance minister, and Helmut Schmidt as finance minister in Germany, uh, started a discussion, uh, a regular discussion of finance ministers in the White House Library. That then, when they became mutually the, uh, the president of the French Republic and the Chancellor of Germany, they put onto the level of uh, the superpower summit. So the first of those was in Rambouillet. Um, you know, I think you're going to see things like that, uh, that there, there will be new initiatives like exactly that, uh, that will regalvanize the existing institutions. Because I think the, you know, something like the Belt and Road Initiative is actually already beginning to, 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 to fail. The, BRICS Bank, the so-called BRICS Bank, the New Development Bank, is based on a kind of flawed concept of undermining the US dollar. It's not likely to succeed if it does that. If it does something in terms of thinking about a more genuinely comprehensive approach to reform of the international monetary system in a world in which the digital technology makes this possible, uh, you will really get great opportunities. So, you know, I would, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to think about the economic ones. You know, I think uh, actually, you know, what we're in at the moment uh, makes NATO more important than ever. So NATO is one of the ones that actually, sort of curiously, uh, will survive and will be, be, be critical. We have two final questions. We'll take them as a block of two, and then you'll have the final words here. Thank you. I have a question. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice. I have a question concerning Europe and one concerning the war in, in Ukraine. Um, I think it's, it's clear by now that Brexit is a huge loss for the European Union and for the UK as such as well. How? how I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <clears throat> I think it's clear by now that the that Brexit is a huge loss for the European Union and for the UK. Can this loss ever be overcome and how? And concerning the, the uh, war in the Ukraine, uh, Russia has turned the economy, the Russian economy, into a war economy. Almost 30% of Russian GDP now are products and services that have to do with the military uh, and the war. How long do you think can Russia run this course? Thank you. Uh, my name is Arthur. I'm from International Affairs here. Uh, I guess I have two questions interlinked. Uh, one is that you said in the beginning of uh, how, given all those leaders, 
how ch uh, China is uh, mostly looking ahead, thinking about how they in the future can dominate economically. But given all that you said, how do you, do you see that compared to what others did in the past and even the Chinese in themselves, uh, is impossible, like in the sense of fragmentation, is impossible to have uh, the, this uh, expansion is actively military, like the, the a Chinese more more dominant power in the in the future. Uh, I would like uh, your opinion. And the second is uh, you showed many turning points the, the, since the 19th century. Could go even back. Very interesting theory. Uh, I. I was thinking about the, the 1848 uh, uh, situations was one of uh, that challenged the established order in a, in a sense that can be said as a crisis. But other things that happened before, like the Napoleonic Wars and other things, uh, created a new balance of power and in uh, situations uh, that in the future would arise new new powers that uh, create a new. Uh, imposes to economic theories, and the West still holds in a way that uh, today it seems like though those pr protagonists in the past have no no personality, if you could say so, uh, like that. So I would ask if you think that only those crises, economics or revolutions, really make changes, or or do those ideas in globalization can arise also from. Uh, more peaceful uh, uh, changes, like a uh, like an introduction of technology, like in the first industrial revolution with the yeah. the, the yeah. machine, or in in uh, changes in the balance of power, like in the previous wars that happened in Europe. Right. No, no, it's a very good question, and I'm I'm, I'm glad you. you Ask that because it helps me to clarify also a bit of the argument, which we, we, is that no, no you, uh, I, I mean, you don't need uh, the violent uh, overthrow. Um, and, uh, you know, in that sense, the middle of the 19th century was very different to the 1970s. Uh, you know, there really isn't a violent overthrow of anything there. And, you know, states that people thought were countries that people thought were ungovernable in the 1970s really find a way of restoring governability. And uh, there's, a, there's a kind of reinvention of government in a largely peaceful way. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it is actually, um, you know, part of the Helmut Schmidt, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing achie achievement that they, 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 they do that. Um, uh, the uh, first uh, double question on Brexit and uh, the uh, capacity of Russia to sustain its aggression. Um, uh, yes, I think Brexit was a catastrophe for the uh, UK. Um, I'm not sure that it is a catastrophe for the European Union. Uh, I'm struck, you know, in many things, there's a divergence of views uh, between official opinion here in Berlin and official opinion in Paris. Uh, I, I, I think not many people in Paris lament uh, the uh, uh, exit of the United Kingdom. Um, many people in Berlin do. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's happened. It's, uh, it's, it's not likely to be reversed uh, for the foreseeable future. And what it actually has done is to get rid of a perpetual irritant in many of the European debates. So if you're thinking about move to greater fiscal integration, that was something that the UK was always highly resistant to. Um, you know, this is what's happening after COVID already uh, with the next generation EU project. It's what's going to happen uh, with the military preparations. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the European Union is moving in a way that it couldn't have done so easily paralyzed by this um, this uh, uh, you know, problem of uh, Britain's half-hearted relationship uh, to, to Europe. You know, I'm reminded of the, um, you know, some of you may have read uh, Wolfgang Schäuble's memoirs uh, that just appeared a few weeks ago. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, Wolfgang Schäuble has in that book is the infected limb theory about why Greece should have been kicked out of the euro. 
either in 2012 or in 2015, um, that you know, if you've got an infected limb, uh, you hack it off, and uh, you know, indeed, it is. It 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 is. Uh, I, I mean, it's it. No, I mean, it's a serious medical solution to many uh, many difficult problems. Uh, but the infected limb was not so much Greece; it was the UK. Um, and uh, you know, speaking as a UK national, I'm extremely sad about that. But thinking of it as a European, I think you had to hack off the infected limb and you won't want to reattach it. Um, uh, on on uh, Russia, uh, no, it's unsustainable what Russia is doing. Um, I, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, the tactic is obvious uh, that, uh, you know, there will be an increased military push. Uh, you're seeing it at the moment. You'll see it right up to the November election. Um, uh, what President Putin is doing is to make an enormous bet uh, that Donald Trump will be the new president of the United States. And then he thinks that there will be a, a different kind of uh, peace than the one that uh, Europeans or that uh, President Biden's administration would accept. Um, I still believe that's an implausible bet. Uh, and that the moment that it appears that Mr. Putin has lost that bet, he will lose his grip on power. I still believe that uh, he has a tenuous grip. Uh, it's uh, the Prigozhin revolt showed how precarious it was. Uh, and uh, that the moment uh, that this bloody and inhuman action that he's engaged in at the moment uh, is finally rewarded by the defeat of his American ally, uh, you will see the end of both Trump and Putin. So that's the optimistic note. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to it with great enthusiasm. Um, Thank you so much, Harold, for, um, for a talk which one could actually say, sometimes you listen to talks which are uh, deep but boring, and sometimes you listen to talks which are emotional but shallow. Thank you for contributing a contribution of both deep and emotional, and uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for being inspirational, both historically and when it comes to the national and international orders of our time. Once again, thanks to the Hertie School as a wonderful partner to set it up uh, tonight. Um, looking forward to your talk, Cornelia, in the second half of the year, and the final line of uh, advertisement on July 2nd. We have our next Civilized Provocation, which is uh, our second series, and uh, we have a high official of the BMWK among us tonight, but it's another high official of the BMWK, Franziska Pantner, who will debate uh, the CEO of DM, the Drogerie, about the European Union and bureaucracy, and how in the aftermath of the European elections, we might perhaps not just get a better EU, but also an EU which gets us somewhere closer to less, or let's say, better bureaucracy. With that, have a good Tanzin and Mai, as I said in my early remarks. And thanks again, Harold, for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.